welcome to Game On. I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. I'm Katie B. alongside Brent Holloway, my Monday co-host and writer for SB Nation he is. And, of course, Brian Perkle is behind the board for us. Phone lines are officially open, folks, 770-535-2911. We want you to weigh in on several things, and we'll get to them briefly. But I want to start the show off, Brent, by asking you this simple question. Whether it was North Carolina Duke, whether it was Mizzou, Texas A&M, whether it was the Iron Bowl, Georgia, Georgia Tech, across the board, all sports, and we've got rivalry, God, that's hard to say, weekend for basketball, too. I'd even say we have it for high school football and, you know, Lanier Land maybe is considered a rivalry. Best one ever. Yeah, I mean... It's hard once you start stacking up all those, you know, amazing Saturdays. It seems like they always come in bunches during college football season, especially, you know, one game goes wild at the noon slot. And then next thing you know, there's four or five in a row all the way all the way through the day. Yeah, we hadn't really had that this year. And to have it in rivalry week when there's so much on the line and then to just the topper, uh, you know, locally, of course, there's the Georgia Georgia Tech game going to over to double overtime. And that's fantastic. But then the topper with so much on the line. A game ending like the Iron Bowl did. I've, I've never seen it in a game in that way. Nick Saban said he'd never seen a game in that way. Yeah, yeah, it, it's definitely up there. One of the uh, the greatest uh, twelve hour windows <laughs> of football. And I mean, you could go back to Thursday. It started with the with the Egg Bowl. That was an amazing game. It was. It was. And it, we're going to get to talk about the Iron Bowl. And of course, because we are who we are, and we are in sports media, we're going to question some of the decisions made uh, down the line. So we're going to get to some Iron Bowl chatter. And folks, we do want you to weigh in on that coming up. But first, the Bulldogs extended their era of domination by defeating the Gala Jackets 41-30 in double overtime Saturday night at Bobby Dodd Stadium. Here's the ball game. Snap to Lee. He'll throw it in the end zone. It's batted in the air and knocked away. It hits the ground. We hit the ground. We battered it down. Dogs win it in overtime. You just heard from Scott Howard, voice of the Georgia Bulldogs. Got that care of GeorgiaBulldogs.com. Georgia rallying from a 20 to nothing deficit. And, of course, the win, the Bulldogs fifth in a row, over Tech 12th and 13 seasons under head coach Mark Richt. Let's first, before we get into uh, the defense of Saturday, um, which in the second half, decent, still not very good. But before we get to the, the defensive side of the ball, Hudson Mason, 299 yards, 22 of 36 passing. The first few series, I'd even say the first half. Um, he looked a little jittery. He looked scared. But then the young man settled in, and I think we saw in the second half in the two overtime periods what he's capable of. And this is just, uh, you know, the the bottom of the iceberg, as it were. You know, uh, we've still got a lot to build on where he is concerned. But what was your take on Hudson's performance? Yeah, I think he kind of summed it up. Early on, he looked shaky. Uh, he looked like a, a young guy getting his first start in a big rivalry game, which is exactly what he was. Yeah. Came around. I thought the uh, the last drive of the first half was huge, not just for Georgia, you know, going in to win a game, but it was the first time he looked comfortable all day. Yeah. And then he goes in, gets to regroup. All of a sudden, it looks a little more manageable, 20 to 7, not as bad as 20 to 0. It, you know, it looked like it could have just snowballed out of control at one point. Now they've got a manageable game. He comes out in the second half, looks like a different guy. I think we got a good glimpse of the quarterback he's going to be in the offense we're going to see next year starting in that second half. The offense we're going to see. Let's touch on that, Brent. Hudson Mason looked his best in a hurry-up style offense, a, a spread style offense, um, where he is rarely under center. And that's really what he played at Lasseter. Yeah, going all the way back to high school. Right. Um, Mike Bobo has run that offense in two-minute sets with Aaron Murray. Do you see him changing and that being... You know, uh, I don't want I don't want to say an Oregon offense, but an Oregon style offense simply because he's got the athletes that can do it. I don't think you see a big difference because the best player on the offense is still going to be Todd Gurley. True. The second best player on the offense might be Keith Marshall. Yeah. Um, You're not going to get too far away from those. But, you know, I mean, Gus Malzahn showed you Saturday night what you can do in a hurry up offense with a running game. So Mm -hmm. I think what you're going to see is just a, you know, the same offense they've run, but you're going to see more often than getting to that hurry-up set. And, you know, there's not a whole lot that changes other than the pace of the offense. And so I think, yeah, we, we might, in order to keep your quarterback comfortable, we might see, you know, a little less of, uh, you know, the uh, traditional two-back right. I formation right. under center. 
and get more of that hurry up from the shotgun. But but, but you're going to find that we're we're, we're you're going to have to to feature Todd Gurley and Keith Marshall because those are your your horses. Evidenced by Saturday, if nothing else, and we'll get to that briefly. I just want to make mention to all of those Georgia offensive linemen out there listening to Game On this Monday evening. You better get in shape because you're going to need to be come next fall. Gurley, 122 yards on 20 carries, four touchdowns, three of them rushing, the other on a nine-yard pass from Mason um, that ended with yet another highlight reel jump into the end zone. This one from about the three. The one last weekend was from the five. Come on, Todd. You know, can't they all be from the five? But I believe Georgia has, um, even without the few games that he played this season, the best running back in the nation, possibly the second best in Keith Marshall, but definitely the best in Todd Gurley. Agree, disagree with that, Brent? That's a tough call. Um, DeAndre Williams, kid at Boston College, looked really good. Um, of course, he as soon as he gets into the Heisman race, he gets hurt, and nobody <laughs> right. gets to really pay attention to him. The Carlos Hyde kid at uh, at Ohio State looks pretty fantastic. I think he's probably uh, taking a taking the jump to the NFL. And there's a, there are a few others here and there, but Gurley is certainly in that conversation as as one of the top five backs in the kind in the country. Seven seven zero five. Three five two nine one one. Your way to weigh in is Todd Gurley, the best running back in the country. Present your argument. We also want to talk about this: uh, the defense. Um, the first three drives for Georgia Tech. First of all, we should start by saying Vadley had a career high where passing yards are concerned: two hundred forty, I believe, two hundred forty-five, something in that area. Um, the first three, four drives for Georgia Tech, they pat, they were pass heavy. They were able to go over the top. Our secondary, yet again, looked um, abysmal. And then Georgia Tech sort of clock managed its way through through the second half. And Georgia was able to gain some momentum and, and get its offense rolling. And the defense was able to get a few stops. Todd Grantham's defense, I'm not going to say Todd Grantham, but Todd Grantham's defense has escaped getting better this entire season. <laughs> and yet... And that goes with the secondary, too. And yet, Mark Richt comes out this weekend and says Todd Grantham will remain at Georgia because continuity is good for Georgia. And that's a direct quote. Continuity is good for Georgia. My question is, what continuity? Mediocre defense? Like, uh, continuing to have a mediocre defense? Let's, let's, let's guess here. What is the mindset behind bringing someone back who isn't fulfilling their obligations in a leadership role? Uh, I think I think there is something to cotton, continuity, at least as far as a philosophical argument goes. Um, I, I tend to, uh, you know, I was told by an Alabama fan back when Arkansas was in the midst of their turmoil, turmoil and decided to hire John L. Smith that, con- <laughs> yeah, yes. that consistency was overrated. And having lived through that debacle where they just kept a guy on from the current staff, I would tend to agree with that. Consistency, mm-hmm. con- continuity is overrated. Um, however, I do understand, you know, that, that Grantham's going into the last year of his contract. He had a young defense this year, so there was expected to be some drop-off. I think he's got one year to prove it, and, and even as loyal and forgiving and all these things as Mark Richt is, I think Grantham's got one year. He's got everybody. What are they losing? One senior? He's got everybody coming back. Yeah. He's going to have to prove it next year or He'll be uh, he'll be you're looking for a job next year. His contract is officially up. He's making eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year is Todd Grantham uh, to put a mediocre defense on the field. Uh, They don't learn from their mistakes. And that's one of my biggest qualms. They don't learn from their mistakes. And case in point, the final play of the Georgia Tech game, the ball was batted up in the air twice. Did you not learn anything from Auburn? Bat it down. Bat it down. All right. Well, the the Auburn thing, like I've, I've got to take issue with that. Um, when you're running with your back to the quarterback, chasing a wide receiver, the ball is in the air. You're trying to make a play on it. It's easier to catch the thing than it is to position yourself in a way that you can get your hand on top of the ball and knock it down right. and not miss it. However, but and, there and were two Georgia guys Tech, there, Brent. <laughs> well, no, there I'm telling two. you, it's easier to say. It's it's a lot easier said than done. Yeah. In that position now right. against Georgia Tech, they're facing the football. Right. That is easy to knock it down, and so I, I can totally see where where all the gripes come from in, in that game. Um, but yeah, the, the fact that they haven't improved is my biggest, and we talked about it on here many times. Ad nauseum. How yes. much 
how much similar, how similar they are to LSU, and both teams lost a ton of talented defenses and had a lot of young guys stepping in for the first time. Throughout the year, LSU under John Chavis has gotten better and better and better and better, and they looked almost like that, you know, that old style LSU defense at the end of the year. Georgia has looked like Georgia all, has looked like this 2013 team all season long. Has not been able to defend the pass. Has looked susceptible to one thing or another in every game. Yeah. And has shown no improvement. I've I've never really been a huge Grantham fan. I thought they have underachieved under him almost every year. I would say maybe two years ago. I thought they they lived up to potential. I think he's got one more year to prove it, and I'm I'm fine with that. I guess. Um, but uh, but they're going to need to show it next year. Yes, it looks as though they put out eight different starters on the field each game they played this season. We're going to take a short break, but before we do, we're going to head out to the Northeast Georgia Medical Center where our own Bill Main, WDUN's Bill Main of Bill and Joel Morning Show fame, is there for the lighting of the Love Light Tree. Sounded like you were having a great time during the Ken Coleman Show, Bill. I'm sure that that's still the case. Oh, it very much is the case. The uh, program is underway right now, and we have the eighth grade uh, chorus from North Hall Middle School performing, and they are just fabulous. You can hear the crowd applauding in the background. The show chorus from Anoda was just amazing, and we have more great music to come. But I want to tell you, the tree will be lighted here in about the next 10 minutes or so. If you're coming by, come on in. Come into the North Tower or hang in the parking lot and wait till we light the tree. We're actually inside, but the tree is outside, and we'll be lighting that shortly. But I want to remind folks that the Love Light donations are accepted throughout the year. So if you feel like you want to make a donation in July and have a little Christmas in July, you can do that, but certainly we'd love for you to do it during this wonderful Christmas season. It benefits hospice here. At Northeast Georgia Medical Center, they provide in-home nursing care for terminally ill patients. What a wonderful, wonderful service they provide. Hey, come by and be with us. And when you drive by that tree this year and you see it lighted up, hey, why don't you take time to make a donation and put your own love light on that tree so we can make the world a little bit brighter, shall we? We're at the Northeast Georgia Medical Center for the lighting of the love light tree, Bill Main, with WDUN, fulfilling another dream, and that's to be on with Game On with Katie B. <laughs> oh, I love it. I'm going to tell you what Ken said. My boss kissing up to me. That's when you know it's a good day. I want to say briefly before we go to our break, my favorite view of the Love Light Tree on the top of the Northeast Georgia Medical Center is coming down Highway 53. If you're coming from, say, the Olive Garden down towards Lake Shore Mall, when you crest that hill going down, look straight out. You'll see the Love Light Tree. It is a beautiful, beautiful view in Gainesville. We'll be right back on Game On, and when we come back, we're going to continue our conversation about Georgia, about Georgia's defense. We want you to call in, 770-535-2911. If at any time you want to weigh in on whether or not you think Georgia defensive coordinator Todd Grantham should return next season, And why or why not? Give us a call, 770-535-2911. This is a defense that finished 11th in the Southeastern Conference in points allowed at 30 per game and 8th in total yards, 381 per game they gave up. 770-535-2911. Y'all have got to go check out our new app, folks. Access WDUN. It has streaming audio, of course, but also a really cool feature that allows you to interact with WDUN in real time. It's called the Activity Stream, and it's one of the many features that has this app rocking, so make sure that you go check it out. Things that didn't rock. From this past weekend in college football, Ohio State's Marcus Hall flipping the bird to the big house in Michigan. I want to why wasn't he punished for that action? Or at least I haven't heard that he was punished for that action. What did you think about that? Yeah, they they were uh, publicly reprimanded. There will be no suspension. Publicly reprimanded by Urban Meyer. (laughs) No, by by the Big Ten offices. But uh, I think it's pretty clear. Um, And, you know, I was fine with uh, if, if it was just the fight. Because it was instigated by Michigan. Yes, it was. Indeed. Yeah, and, you know, I I could see, you know, further punishment for him just from the fight, but it was that kid's actions afterward that really, uh, you've got to do something more, a public reprimand. How how just pointless is that? Uh, And I think if it weren't a national title riding on the line, then uh, we might see further punishment. But it it makes you wonder, as a Michigan State fan, you know, it's pretty transparent now that everybody in your own conference is pulling for the other team. Yeah. So, 
It'll be an interesting game to watch as far as how it's officiated and that kind of thing for the conspiracy theorists out there. A public reprimand from the Big Ten, but not from Urban Meyer. I shouldn't be surprised. Same man that housed Aaron Hernandez, and we know how that worked out for him. Uh, Georgia Southern, an interesting tidbit I learned today, Brent, and I want to see if it cracks you up as much as it did me because we spent a good part of our Monday last week talking about uh, Florida losing to Georgia Southern, Georgia Southern beating Florida, whichever way you want to look at it. In their dining hall, Georgia Southern served Gator. I heard about that. Uh, and Jeff Munkin, the coach at Georgia Southern, quite literally in the lunchroom lady, or in the lunchroom, not lunchroom lady, in the lunchroom, dishing up alligator. Could any other school get away with that? Well, they could certainly afford it after the payout they got <laughs> to uh, yep. to beat up on Florida. For name and yawn for everyone. Exactly. I yes. hope they brought in a, uh, a legit... Uh, South Louisiana chef to, to serve that up right because uh, they could afford it. Um, no, that's great. That That's the kind of thing, you know, Georgia Southern is, a, is an excellent program, but yeah. you don't get a chance to go in and beat an SEC program in their own house that often. So when you do, yeah, man, live it up. We had Jeff Munkin on the show last Wednesday. If you want to check out a podcast of that interview, you can log on to our Facebook page, Game On with KDB Davis, or follow me on Twitter at KTB Davis is the handle. He was pretty candid the day before Thanksgiving. That was the first time last weekend, the first time in 17 years he hasn't been coaching on Thanksgiving, so he was definitely going to enjoy it with his family. He said he might even play Barbies with his daughter. As a man with a daughter, 10 years from now, on a Thanksgiving, will you be playing Barbies, Brent Holloway? It hasn't come to that yet, uh, so I can still tell myself that I'll have my, you know, man time on the couch post-dinner <laughs> while, you know, the women clean the kitchen or whatever, even though that's not how wow. it works now. <laughs> yeah. I can still pretend to have these fantasies, but no. Um, a, a buddy of mine who has four girls told me the day that my daughter was born, Heaven Girls turns you into a sissy, <laughs> and I can already see the transformation coming. Right, right. Yeah, uh, that's funny you say the women in the kitchen cleaning up. My mom and two sisters, after our Thanksgiving, we had Thanksgiving on Saturday because, well, I was working on Thursday. Uh, so we had Thanksgiving on Saturday, and so it was me and my father and my brother-in-law um, in the den watching football games mm -hmm. and my sister, the women folk, even though I'm a woman too, <laughs> the women folk were in the kitchen um, cleaning up. I'm sure my mother and sisters will appreciate that. Uh, Christmas at Gaylord Opryland Resort. Folks, the drawing for this Christmas giveaway, Care of WDUN, happening tomorrow morning on the Bill and Joel Morning Show. Now, you can go to WDUN.com and register to win the trip but we've got one of the final ways to do it via one of our shows on WDUN. Be the fifth caller into 770-535-2911. We're looking for the fifth caller, folks, 770-535-2911. And we will give you a free plan service agreement from our friends at Climate Solutions. And you will be one of 12 people um, from our uh, airwaves, that is, entered into the drawing for the Christmas at Gaylord Opryland Resort Prize. Two nights at the Opryland Hotel, two tickets to Radio City Christmas Spectacular, two tickets to Lori Morgan's Enchanted Christmas Dinner and Show. There's a whole ton of things you get with this giveaway, plus a planned service agreement from our friends at Climate Solutions. This is the Christmas at Gaylord Opryland Resort Prize Giveaway presented by Climate Solutions. Fifth caller in to 770-535-2911. And make sure... You are listening to the Bill and Joel Morning Show tomorrow morning from 5.30 to 9, where they will do the drawing for this incredible giveaway. Um, and we should go ahead and say congratulations to whoever wins it, because that is a trip. I wouldn't be able to afford that trip. That's unbelievable. Uh, so make sure that you, you give us a call here. All right. When you think about last weekend and, and, and Iron Ball Talk coming up, all of you standing by waiting to dial us up and talk the final play of the Iron Ball. When you think about this weekend, give me a couple of things that, that stand out to you sans uh, that, that last second literally play in the Iron Bowl? You know, um, I think it would have to be something from the Ohio State-Michigan game because I started off, you know, that game was at noon. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll watch this like I do most uh, Big Ten games until the, uh, the 1230 uh, SEC game starts. Yeah. But I got drawn in, um, mm -hmm. and that was, a, that was a very entertaining game. And we've known throughout the season that Ohio State can move the football. They've got talent on that right. side of the ball. Um, now, defensively, I think we saw that they've got some, some They're vulnerable. Some They're suspect. They've yeah. got some issues. But, man, that was an entertaining game. I thought Michigan 
came through and, you know, the Jekyll and Hyde team that they are played one of their better games of the year. It was really fun to watch those teams go back and forth and, and the way it came down and, and ended. You know, I didn't necessarily love the play call. I would have seen them maybe do something that incorporated Devin Gardner's ability to run. Yeah. But you had to go for two there. And uh, I tell you, that was, a, that was a standout game and a great way to start off the day. You're absolutely right. You mentioned Ohio State suspect defense. Uh, 41.603 yards they gave up to to Michigan, a team that has not been known for its offensive prowess this year. Um, and, and the 61st toughest schedule, those stats coming from Sir Skip Bayless himself of ESPN. Uh, this is a team vying for a berth in the national title game this Saturday in the Big Ten Championship against Michigan State. I tweeted out, and I firmly believe this, come Saturday we are all Michigan State fans. At least I am. If you're pulling for an SEC team in the national title game, uh, you got to be pulling for Michigan State Saturday in the Big Ten Championship game. Uh, going back to your comment on the play, and we've got about a minute left here. You know, Brady Hoke asked his seniors, what do you want to do? And they said, go for two. And so they went for two. And uh, the play call to me, meh. But I think part of the reason I have uh, I'm disgruntled with the play call is because Devin Gardner stared down his yeah he stared down his target he knew where he was going when yeah. he took the snap and it it was obvious it was, well at least it was obvious to me that in the in the pre play huddle you know they were saying we think this guy's going to be open yeah and he's just not a confident enough quarterback uh, in those type of situations to to check down to look at different options or to run, to use his legs. Right. Uh, so stared down his target. And ho- horrible way for that game to end for the Michigan Wolverines. That would have made their season. Um, Ohio State with a with a one-point win there. want to congratulate Greg Smith of Gainesville. He not only won the planned service agreement from our friends at Climate Solutions, but he is in the drawing for the Christmas at Gaylord Opryland Resort prize pack. And boy, is it ever packed out. Greg, make sure you're listening to Bill and Joel tomorrow morning between 5.30 and 9 for the drawing. And best of luck to you in that. Thanks for listening to Game On, and thanks for giving us a call. When we come back, folks, there's a petition on change.org by Alabama fans pleading for overtime because they say Auburn's Chris Davis stepped out of bounds. Oh, yeah, we're going over the Iron Bowl. Come on back and join us. was quite possibly the greatest college football game ever played. And I can only go on the last 34 years. Number four, Auburn beat number one, Alabama. 34-28. On a last second play that involved a 109-yard kick return. Field goal return. Maybe that's what you call it. I'm unsure. Here's Alabama coach Nick Saban after the game. The fact of the matter is, is uh, we didn't make plays when we needed to, um, whether it's a made field goal with a penalty, uh, a missed field goal after that, um, going for it on fourth and less than a yard and not being able to make it, um, making the decision to do what we did at the end of the game, uh, not cover the, 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 the kick properly. Uh, we knew they had a guy back there. We told everybody we got a fan and cover. It's something that we've worked on. It just looked like we didn't have anybody out on the right side, you know, the right wing and the right tight end. Everybody's supposed to fan the field. We covered to the left. That's why he went to the right. Um, so I, I, I couldn't see it that well down their sidelines. But um, first time I've ever lost a game that way, first time I've ever seen a game lost that way. Many questions surrounding the end of this game, one of which, according to Alabama folk, did or did not – Chris Davis step out of bounds on the run back. Of course, the picture they show with the petition they have on change.org is his foot in midair and not necessarily on the ground. So, uh, no, if that if that picture's in a, any indication of whether or not he did, then no, he did not. But uh, a lot of questions surrounding the end of this game. Should Nick Saban have gotten A.J. McCarron to, to throw a Hail Mary? Um, uh, you know, do you still put in Cade Foster, even though he's missed two field goals. Um, But the biggest thing is, why don't you have any speed in your coverage? I think what you saw in the coverage of that run back was a lot of linemen, and that's fine and good, but they can't run with Chris Davis. Uh, Your take on the end of that game, Brent? I think all the second guessing is just pure hindsight. Um, Now, taking what we have seen, I wouldn't be surprised if you put in a special package 
for your long, your extra long field goal, you know, where you've got a little more speed on the field for that reason. But, I mean, you've got to have the big guys on the field in your regular field goal unit. Yeah. You know, you've got to keep those, you've got to keep them out and you've got to keep him, your, your kicker protected. We saw a kick get blocked earlier in the game. So, you know, all the second guessing to me is a little bit silly. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can, you can always, you know, pick and choose little decisions that were made throughout the course of a game in any game by any coach when they come out on the losing end. And I think in, in this case, uh, it seems like there are a lot of those, mm-hmm. but all of them in the moment, I thought uh, I didn't think any of them were, were rash or, or, you know, really indefensible decisions or anything like that. We knew that Auburn was a good team. Uh, obviously, Coach Ma- Co- Gus Malzahn, um, one of this year, if not the best college football coach in what he's done to turn that, that program around. Um, but I'm, And I think that the common consensus was Al- Auburn would be able to hang with Alabama, but Alabama would still win. What is it about this Auburn team? Uh, you know, they say luck is when opportunity meets preparation. You don't prepare for 109-yard kick returns with one second to go in a game, and you don't prepare, you know, to play tip drill in the last couple of seconds in, in, like they had in the game against Georgia. Is this a team of destiny? I don't know what else you call it at this point. <laughs> uh, you know, I've heard a lot of people um, defending Auburn, and, you know, luck is, I forget what it was, the residue of preparation or all these, like, really hokey right. sayings. <laughs> um yeah, they've been lucky. Yeah. Let's just be clear about it. Now, they are, they've been good enough to put themselves in position to benefit from that luck, mm-hmm. and they deserve credit for that. But they have been lucky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's just call a spade a spade. Right. Um, that I mean, said. The, 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 the left side of the field on that kick, the left side, there was nobody on that side of the field. Mm-hmm. It was like Alabama didn't even exist a little bit in like that the, play. A little bit like the Red Sea. A little Moses. <laughs> if we're going to do it. Hey, listen. <laughs> Chris Davis got a standing ovation in his geology class today at Auburn. Moses, I'm that telling you, he's right there, right? is never going to buy a car no, uh, in, no, in no, South Alabama. No. He's never going to buy a drink. No. His meals are taken care of. <laughs> he's got a good life ahead. Yes. They uh, said, uh, the, you know, the running joke, there's this bar in Auburn, Alabama, called 1716 Bar. And the reason it's named 1716 Bar is because of some great Auburn win over Alabama. Are you now going to rename it the 3428 Bar? Or the 109, you right. know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it, it, this is a play it's hard to even put in perspective i think at this point um because it's still so fresh and weird and just you know unheard of Mm -hmm. this is going to go down this is going to be one of those plays you know it's not quite as crazy as the band is on the field uh from the stanford uh right cow Cow game game. but uh it's it's one of those it's it's one we're going to see the replay of for you know for the rest of our lives you know bless alabama fans hearts oh i know it man (laughs) god that's going to be gut-wrenching but um but yeah it's uh it's you know, it's it's a team that has done everything, has earned the right to be where they're at. Yeah. But they have also benefited from ex- some extraordinary luck, the likes of which we have never seen. Back-to-back weeks, this kind of thing happening, I never never heard of it. Does Auburn have a shot against Missouri? Absolutely. In the SEC title game. But, I mean, not just, well, yes, everyone can win. Sure, everyone, you know, can win, but... I don't know that Missouri can stop Auburn. I don't know that any. I don't know that anyone. If if Nick Saban couldn't do it, I'm not real sure anyone can stop what Gus Malzahn's putting on the field offensively. That's that's my thing. Um, Malzahn is a is a brilliant play caller, and it's not that his offense is so complex or anything. It's a lot of simple stuff. Mm-hmm. But that's the thing. Every offensive play is designed to be successful. Yeah. All you need to do is execute it and call the right ones. Now, that's tough to do, obviously. He's got a knack for it. If you, if you noticed, uh, they were doing so much of the, of the uh, Trey Mason up the middle, 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 mm-hmm. and just grinding out some tough yards. And then when they, you know, they're, they're time's running out on him, you're like, okay, Gus, you right, know, we got to get right. going. And then they run the same action, boot off of it. You think, okay, here comes the run from the quarterback because he can't pass. And he just kind of shot puts one <laughs> to a wide open receiver who goes 39 yards, right. touchdown. Which is actually how Nick Marshall throws. So, yes, <laughs> that's a good, that's good. That's a good uh, description of, of that. So they've got the talent. To, to win this game, um, and that's no slight to Missouri. I think Missouri's got a very good defense. Mm-hmm. Now, I think they're better against the pass, 
And it'll be interesting because, you know, Auburn's going to need to get some yards through the air. And they've got a, they're, they're going to be facing a defense that held Mike Evans to four catches and eight yards. And he might be the <laughs> most He's a beast. unguardable receiver mm-hmm. in the NCAA. Yeah. And they just shut him down. So th- it's going to be tough. But, um, you know, what Missouri really does is get after the quarterback, and that's going to be kind of neutralized in this game. They're going to run right at the heart of that defensive line, which is very talented. The, um, the, I think Missouri's best shot, even though I think these teams are, are fairly even mm-hmm. talent-wise, I think Auburn's a two-point favorite, which tells you pretty much, you know, what to expect. Um, how does Auburn rebound from one of the most monumental wins in that storied program's history yeah and and i think that that's a good point to bring up the the emotion of saturday's game but you combine that with the emotion of the last second victory even against georgia um what this team has done the last few weeks at some point is going to catch up to them and is it this week can they pull off another emotional win can they pull off another huge win because being the fifth team in the country would do that even though they're now the third team in the country it would, you know, it would be yet another uh, emotional win, especially when you consider that an SEC title is on the line. I want to go back to Alabama here for a minute. How do they recover? That's a good question. Uh, you know, because Alabama's never really been, or at least in A.J. McCarron's tenure, we'll say, in Nick Saban's tenure, Alabama really hasn't had its heart broken. The shine... For, I mean, and it's almost, it, it really is, it's irrational, but the shine seems off of them all yes. of a sudden. Like, yes. okay, this is just a program that's good and not the, you know, unstoppable dynasty likes of which we've never seen before. Right. Uh, and like I said, I, I think it's a little a little irrational. It's one loss lost in an incredibly fluky way. But, uh, you know, if you look at it going forward, you know, of course, they're going to have just loads of talent at every position, but they're losing AJ McCarron, who has been the one real stabilizing, you know, key piece of that offense mm-hmm. over the course of this three year run. And, you know, we've got we know we've got Blake Sims coming back, but he's not your prototypical quarterback. They haven't run that kind of offense that Blake is best suited for. Right. But know, Gus Malzahn style offense. Yeah. We know they've got uh you know, a, a, just a slew of running backs, five star talent. We know they got quarterbacks, five star talent. Linemen, defensive guys. Then they've got a lot of uh, a lot of returning talent, not just guys we haven't seen before. Right, talents there, but but they no longer seem invincible. And there's something to that. Well, and I think that actually began last year in the SEC title game against Georgia because Georgia was really um, an an opponent that Alabama should have blown out mm-hmm. on paper. Alabama was supposed to blow them out, and then we even we saw Alabama vulnerable at the beginning of this season. Mm-hmm. They didn't lose; they were still vulnerable. And Texas A and M still able to put monster numbers up on them. And Texas A and M not as good this year as they were last year. Um, but I think really where the vulnerability peaked and why it peaked, we saw unsaban like mistakes made. Yep. And, and and I am putting the onus on Nick Saban. We saw him make mistakes. That ain't happened before. Right. It, it You know, it doesn't. It, the Johnny Manziel throw last year when Texas A&M beat Alabama, that wasn't a coverage breakdown. That was an incredibly athletic play by a future Heisman winner. But the calling down the stretch in this game, there's they, some chink in Nick Saban's armor. They were under pressure and they cracked. They were under pressure. He got out coached. Yeah, he got out coached. And, and I don't know that he's gotten out coached before. He has before. It's so rare. It's hard to remember those times when it's happened. Uh, you know, I think that it, it's an interesting discussion to have. Saban's not a young man anymore. Yeah. At some point, you know, those those sharp and those heightened senses dull. They fade. Mm-hmm. You know, you become more of a CEO. Just ask Phil Farmer. Yeah. Yes. Joe Paterno, all yeah. these guys. Uh, and, and, it, and it happens. Um, Bobby Bowden. Um, and I think, I think you know, from a, status or a tactician standpoint, Saban's above all those guys in, in his prime. Yeah. How long does he hold on to it? I think he's still there. Just, just to be clear, I think he's still there. But it's at least an interesting conversation to have. Um, but I think if you really want to talk about what happened in that game, you have to be able to run the ball against Alabama. That has been the key. The, the Georgia game last year, Georgia was smashing them, running mm-hmm. it right at them. If you can do that, 
that takes away some of their own bravado. Yeah. All of a sudden, they don't feel so invincible <laughs> right, because right. you're mashing them. And that's what Auburn did. And once you knock them off the hill and you're down looking them eye to eye, then you've got a ball game. And, and it's happened every time. We're going back to uh, South Carolina, when, when they pulled off the upset, I think it was 2010. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, uh, I think Stephen Garcia was the quarterback, and he had a great game. It was 18 out of 21. But he only threw it 21 times because South Carolina ran it like 45. Right. You know, just 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 enough, just punching them in the mouth and just moving the chains. And if you can do that, that to me seems like the formula for beating Alabama. It'll be interesting to see how the Crimson Tide recovers from this one because it wasn't just a loss. It was a last second loss. It was a loss that wasn't in in nobody's mind. Could you ever fathom this happening? He returns a field goal attempt, 109 yards, and they win, and Auburn wins in the last second. How do they recover from that emotionally? How do they recover from the sting of not even being in the running for a third straight SEC title or national title? It'll be interesting to see how they recover. When we come back on Game On, and by we, I mean myself, Katie B. Davis, and SB Nation writer Brent Holloway, we're going to wrap up this hour, which always seems to fly by, week in and week out, day in and day out. We're going to wrap it up by talking BCS. What's next? Last weekend of the college football season coming up, Sands Bowl season. What's going to happen? We'll speculate. You come on back and join us. Christmas music streaming on WDUN.com. Stream three, folks. So if you're one of the many, a bit put out by the like of Christmas music options in the area, we have one we think you might like. Streaming some pretty good Christmas music. Do you do you do the whole, like, when Thanksgiving ends, are you full on Christmas? Are you a Christmas music fan? Yeah, I, I, you know, I like it. Um... I kind of ease into it. I'm not sitting there waiting on the season to start. <laughs> When's it going to flip over? When's it right? Yeah, but uh, but yeah, of course, you know, like to uh, you know once a year go out with the with the wife, get a get a good you know hot chocolate or a, a, a cappuccino or something, mm-hmm. and drive around. On, hopefully on a chilly night because it needs oh, to be yeah. cold. And uh, you know, look at the lights, listen to Christmas music. You know, get into the uh, you know get into the season. Does uh, Katie B. Davis back here with with Brent Holloway, writer for SB Nation, and my Monday co-host on Game On? We appreciate you being with us. Does having a child make you more childlike at the holidays? I'm pretty childlike Deep anyway. Thoughts. Yeah, you are. <laughs> yeah, you are. That's why we always got along so well. Um, so okay, so no, not really that much. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it'll be interesting. You know, at this point, we had a. Uh, we had said, you know, her favorite thing are like remote controls. We're just going to get her a box of old remote <laughs> controls. <you know? laughs> my nephew, my nephews with cell phones, like right, old cell yeah. phones. Right. So, I mean, at this point, you know, she doesn't know what's going on. Of course, uh, now as you know, she gets a little bit older, and you know, you remember when you when, when you're a kid, mm-hmm. you know, December lasts forever. Yes, it you does. Know? And so, when when I can see that excitement building, you know, in her, that'll be it'll be an interesting time. I'm sure that'll kind of you know liven up the the season for all of us. Do you have a family member that dresses up like Santa, or do you take her to a Santa to get pictures made? Or yeah, of course we'll have to do the uh, traditional Santa right. in the mall pose, or you know downtown or wherever it is. Um, we haven't done the uh, the dressing up since I was a little bitty kid. All the uh, all the kids in my family are are, are my age. Right. You know, there's a generation of cousins that are all around the same age, and so it's been you know it's been a good you know 25 years since that went down. But I could see it I could see it coming back. I wish somebody in my family would dress up like Santa still. <laughs> I can remember, and we're going to get to more sports talk here briefly, folks, but, you know, we like to chat every once in a while about things other than uh, balls being hit or caught or thrown. Um, I can remember when I was a little girl, I got a chalkboard for Christmas, and Santa had written a message. If you have children listening to Game On right now, plug their ears. A message had been written by Santa on the chalkboard. And looking back at that picture, because it was a picture taken of all of mine and my sister's gifts, and we each have our own side of the tree. Mine's the middle, Christy's to the left of me, and my sister Bonnie's to the right of me. And so we each had our pile of gifts, and I got a chalkboard, and Santa had written a message on the chalkboard. There's a picture taken of our piles, and you can see the handwriting on the chalkboard. (laughs) And I, that's not a metaphor. Literally, you can see the handwriting on the chalkboard. And looking back at it now, you know. Yeah. And yeah. I wonder if my sisters knew that was my daddy's handwriting and didn't <laughs> tell me. Because you know? it's so my dad's handwriting. But anyway, we digress. All right, BCS. Um, because Alabama lost, the thought is that there won't be an SEC 
team in the BCS title game. And as things stand right now, should Ohio State stay undefeated by beating Michigan State in a Big Ten championship, FSU will stay undefeated because they will beat Duke in the ACC championship. An SEC team will not be in the BCS title game. I am of the thought, though, that Michigan State um, deserves a lot more respect than they're getting and quite possibly is a team that will beat Ohio State in the Big Ten Championship. So um, let's let's play speculators instead of spectators. Michigan State beats Ohio State. Missouri beats Auburn. Is Mizzou in the national title game? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I don't think there's there's any question about it. If Ohio State loses, is whoever comes out of the SEC title game the winner in? That's the way I see it. Now, yeah. the way it, it's stacked up right now, Missouri is still fifth, of course, in the BCS behind Alabama with a quality win that they would get against Auburn. Mm-hmm. That would move them ahead, I think, in the computers and and certainly in the minds of the voters. I think we would see that jump that would be big enough yeah. to move them. I mean, they'd probably be the number two team in the country at that point, and I think we'd have a, a very obvious matchup with Florida State. How do you see the other, or what have you seen um, that, that leads to your speculations about where teams will go in other bowl games? That's going to be... You know, it it really is going to be an interesting bowl season because I think there's so much parity, more than usual. Yeah. Uh, parity is not the norm for college football. You know, we've seen that, you know, it kind of creep in. But I think this year, more than more than most others, there's just, you know, there's not a there's not much difference between those at the top and, and those at the bottom of the top 25. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. However it gets distributed, it's going to be, we're going to get a lot of really interesting matchups. I was kind of hoping that we might still catch a uh, and that Oregon-Alabama matchup. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen oh, at this point. Oh, how the mighty have fallen! Oh. And I think Oregon's fallen so far, they're probably not, not going to get that BCS slot. No, they so. won't. I know, I do not. Does Baylor? That's interesting. Uh, you know, Baylor... Um, I don't know if it was a hangover or what. They didn't look like much of anything yeah. against TCU coming off the loss against Oklahoma State. Um, I, I really don't know what to make of most of these teams at this point. I, I've done a pretty good job um, looking at the point spreads, picking out some winners throughout the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I crashed and burned hard <laughs> over the weekend. <laughs> it yeah. Was, yeah, it was bad. <laughs> All right. So in order to get an SEC team in the BCS title game, and listen, I don't care how sick you are of Alabama winning. If you live in the South, if your team fought in the war, and by team I mean state, then you've got to be rooting for an SEC team to be in the national title game. Brent, an Arkansas fan, are you rooting for an SEC team in the national title game? Yeah, I mean, if, you know what, I, I'm, I'm just really, my interest is really piqued by this Big Ten championship, which is a weird thing to say. Uh, uh, no, but, I completely agree with you. But what we've got is uh, strength on strength yeah. with Michigan State defense and Ohio State offense and weakness on weakness with the uh, vice versa. Right. So, I really want to see how that game plays out, not just because of how much it has riding on it, just because we're finally going to learn more about these teams. They haven't played very many tough tough teams throughout the the conference schedule, but I think both of these teams are legitimate. And uh, and if, if if Ohio State wins, more power to them. They hadn't lost in two years, yeah. so so let them go. You know, let them go get the head kicked in. <laughs> <by James. laughs> oh, I hear that because it will happen. And you know what, Brent and I'll be back next Monday to talk about it. The two of us, I. Solo individually. We'll be back tomorrow at seven for another. You heard it. Game on. She's just the girl, but she's on fire.